Hello everybody. Today is a big moment for me because at long last I get to, for the first time, experience a Ferrari 458 Speciale. And here we have, I think, the most universally and consistently praised sports car of the modern era. Just about any and everybody who has ever had the pleasure of sampling one has said it's not just a good car, it's not just a great car, it is one of the best of all time. Back in 2014, it won Evo's Car of the Year, and more than that, it was the only one ever to do so unanimously, with every single judge saying it was better than everything else that they'd brought. A decade later, Evo then voted it the greatest driver's car of the last 25 years. And along the way, it has picked up a huge number of other gongs and accolades as well. And this is also a car that today is perhaps even more revered than ever, because although we knew it was Speciale in more ways than one when it landed, it today stands as a testament to the old school supercar. This was the swan song, the last dance for the naturally aspirated Ferrari V8. A legendary powertrain, and it was therefore guaranteed to have a place in the hearts of petrol heads. But more than that, it was a car that really was every bit as good as you'd hoped it would be. And so today, I should be sat here just as excited as a teenage girl who's found out that Taylor Swift is putting on a concert in her living room. And in some ways, I am. But I'm also rather apprehensive. Why? Well, because this car is based on the 458 Italia, another that received nearly universal praise. But I seem to be in a minority that thinks that car is really rather overrated. And so today, with this supposedly being even better, even more than that, I'm in either for the drive of my life or the most underwhelming experience of my motoring journalism career. So, what's it to be then? Let's find out. Like me, I am sure, are desperate to get to the all-important question. But in order to answer it correctly, we need to establish a few things first, which are, what is it that I didn't like about the 458 Italia? What is actually different about the Speziali? And then, has it actually made a difference? So, I'm sure you are all familiar with the 458 Italia, Ferrari's mid-engined masterpiece that debuted back at the dawn of the 2010s. It featured a 4.5-litre naturally aspirated V8, making 570 PS, a new styling language courtesy of Donato Coco, inside a brand new interior treatment bringing the firm's cars bang up to date, and it was a car that very quickly established a legend. People loved it then, and they love it now. What didn't I like about it? Well, chiefly, three things. First, that engine. Though yes, it revved to 9,000 RPM, it wasn't particularly exciting. And an engine that is full of so many numbers that sits in the back of a Ferrari really should be exciting. And remember, these are supercars. They exist in a realm beyond logic. It is not simply about being measurably good. It has to talk to you on a level that few other things do. Secondly, the gearbox attached to said engine, an all new seven speed dual clutch. It worked fine, and in a lot of ways, it was better than the old F1 box, a single clutch automated manual, but it just, it just didn't excite. It was competent, yes, but interesting, dynamic, no, not really. And the same could also be said for the car's steering, which at low speeds was fine enough. In fact, the whole thing was really quite surprisingly comfortable, and you could easily do a long continental journey in it. 
But when that crucial moment came and you found yourself on your favourite little ribbon of tarmac and you wanted to have fun, it just became a little aloof. It decided to step outside for a cigarette and left you wondering exactly what was going on beneath you. And for a car as agile and capable as a 458, that is a crime. The Speziali then follows the same recipe as its forebears, the 430 Scuderia, with which I am very familiar, and the 360 Challenge Stradale. So just about every element of it has been reworked, pared back and sharpened to give you a more focused experience. Externally, the car has received many a revision, making this a now sharper and slightly more aggressive thing, though it is still, to my eyes, a beautiful car, even more so than the Italia. You also have now active aerodynamics, whereas before the car had little foldable wings at the front, now it has flaps that can be opened to direct the air where it is needed, and at the back, DRS-style flaps. On the side, you've also got these little winglets, that I think actually are, are kind of cute. And here in carbon against this Bianco Italia exterior, look really, really good. I also like the really purposeful twin exit exhausts as opposed to the F40 inspired ones of the regular car. I love the wheels on it and from factory, these came shod with Speziali specific Pilot Sport Cup 2s. In the engine department, Ferrari then went through things with a fine-toothed comb. Power is now up to 605 PS. Torque remained the same at 398 pounds-feet. That's 540 newton meters, arriving at a heady 6,000 RPM, with the peak power then arriving a little later at 9. Though the numbers don't tell the whole story, because all throughout the rev range, this car is meant to have just a little more than the regular car. The gearbox also has been reworked, refined, reprogrammed, designed for more aggressive and entertaining driving. The car has also undergone a diet, it now weighing some 90 kilos less than the Italia, for a total curb weight in the real world of 1420 kilos. Some 20 more than a Scuderia in a car that now has 100 horsepower more. It is inside that the differences are most obvious, with the car now having more sections of exposed aluminium, acres of carbon fibre, although unlike the Scuderia, they have also done a little bit more to try and retain some of the car's basic features. But still, these nice carbon fibre bucket seats hold you in. This one doesn't have the optional four-point harness or the roll bar, and when new, it would have set you back some £208,000. Plus options, of course. And today, the very cheapest Speziali will set you back about £308,000. Because, even a decade later, it is still the one that everybody wants. So, time then to answer the big question. Can this truly vanquish the ills of the 458 Italia? Is it really that good? Will it also go in my little book of one day must rob a bank to have one? Let's see. This is not the car that I was expecting. I was expecting something that was so unbelievably loud after two minutes you wanted to get out and was also reasonably harsh, a little bit unpleasant and then potentially ultimately still a little bit disappointing. This is not like that at all. You can tell that it is firmer than a regular 458 Italia, but it is still wonderfully compliant. I recently have spent a lot of time with a McLaren 720S. Bear in mind, that is not the special version, it's not the LT. This rides better when you put the car into its bumpy road mode or engage wet on the Manatino. It's still very refined, very nice. 
It also isn't quite as deafeningly loud as I thought it might be. It still isn't anywhere near as sonorous as the Ferraris of old, the 360 or especially the F355, but I think it is a touch more tuneful than, say, the Scuderia. Both of these, though, they're more just noise rather than symphony. The steering, though, well, that's interesting. The front doesn't actually feel quite as hyper alert as I thought that it might, although by any reasonable standards, it still is. However, it does seem to have a little more feel more of the time. And that's just as well, because this is a very, very capable car, and it is a car also capable of making mistakes. John, its very kind owner, who has a number of other exotic machines, tells me that he has spun this in race mode. And as I'm about to put it into race mode, I'm in sport currently, that is something that's going to be at the back of my mind. But I need to put it in race mode because I really want to find out exactly what this car can give me, and that's the mode I have to be in. The first thing you notice when you do that is the exhaust. In sport, it is not too keen to open the valves, but in race mode, you think about touching the throttle and it starts shouting at you. It will make this a very, very annoying thing to be in for a long journey. Turning circle, are you surprised to hear it's not great? I do love the fact that this little sort of, I guess you'd call it a stalk down here maybe, with the three buttons for reverse, auto and launch, that's bespoke to this. Anyway, right, we're in race, I'm going to put it in bumpy road mode because you can tell the suspension is a lot firmer. And now we're going to try and have some fun, but not crash. <laughs> Oh, oh my, yeah, on my list of ills, gearbox, tick, that's more like it Ferrari, yes, oh wonderful, I mean in sport mode it has a little bit of bite, in race it's got a much bigger one, both up and down the box, engine then, my issue before chiefly was the fact that it was very linear and in a lot of ways it still is, but it also has just so much go in it. I mean, truth be told, a lot of the times I'm revving it out more for your benefit so you can hear it go through the rev range than mine. I don't need to take this beyond sort of 5,000 RPM and I can have a lot of fun. But nine is there, so you might as well use it. <laughs> That's a wicked upshift. And the down might be even more aggressive. I think if conditions weren't perfect, or you weren't really intimately familiar with this sort of car, on the road, sport mode is absolutely my recommendation. Particularly with these Cup 2s, which are grippy, but equally bitey, I think you'd find that to be the best balance. I can already tell you that this car feels a big step on from the Italia. And that's important because when I drove the Pista, this car's successor, based on the 488 GTB, I felt like the greatest crime it committed was that, despite the fact it was ludicrously fast and very capable as this is, it just didn't feel markedly different to the car on which it is based. And when in that, and it's the same here, you're talking about today a premium of double to get yourself into a special, if not more. You could pick up a regular Italia for £110,000. You gotta find another 200 to get one of these. Y you really do want something that is going to feel different immediately. This does. These carbon ceramic brakes derived from the LaFerrari hypercar are also fantastic. Feel, brilliant, and stopping power, undeniable. It also, in common with many of the mid-engine Ferraris, also doesn't feel intimidatingly wide, much like a McLaren, because you've got a good view of those haunches, you can place the car with relative ease. It doesn't feel really, to me, any scarier to drive than a Boxster does. The front-engine V12s, 599, F12, 812, they're a different kettle of fish. They are much broader, and because of where you sit in it, that feeling is accentuated. They can be quite scary on these very same roads. This isn't. 
a Lamborghini Aventador is much the same. You feel like you've got one wheel on the inside markers and one wheel on the outside, and you have therefore absolutely no margin of error. I suppose then it's almost a shame that the interior is in some ways even more extreme than its predecessor. You do have speakers more neatly integrated into it. If you wanted those in a scud, you'd have this weird little setup here that stole a bit of your storage from you. Here you've just got a nice, decent sized sort of parcel shelf, I guess you'd call it, and without the harness bar, it's actually a very good size. The same goes for the boot, which has lost a little bit of its capacity to account for the little ducting that Ferrari now use. An early version of, I suppose, what they later termed the S-duct. But inside, there is no glove box. There isn't, in fact, even a little storage net as you would get in the Scud. There are simply two pads for the passenger's knees. In the doors, you've then got, okay, a tiny, tiny little bit of storage, but as the door itself is all carbon, you couldn't really use it without scratching the thing to pieces. Mercifully though, one thing the 458 debuted is the option of suspension lift, which I wager is fitted in the vast majority of these because most owners, myself included, would consider it an essential. And this does mean for big European road trips and the like, where you don't know exactly where you may wind up, your car's gonna be a little bit more versatile. It's something I really, really appreciate. These also, compared to their successors, are quite rare. We don't really know how many 458 Specialis or 488 Pistas Ferrari made, but I can tell you they made a lot more of the later ones. The convertible version, the Speciali Aperta, was genuinely limited, with Ferrari saying they made just 499 units. And for that reason, if you wanted to pick up one of those today, you'd have to part with some £700,000 versus just over 400 for the Pista Spider. And to be honest, that car suffers with scuttle shake. The early cars suffered with scuttle shake. I just don't really think these cars suit being a convertible. It's just not their way. But, I'll tell you something, I don't often bring cars like this down this road, but it's the road that shows you what the Speciali is all about. Maybe it's just because I haven't quite managed yet to get enough heat in those front tyres, but there is still just an air of vagueness on that initial turn-in. But once you've pushed through it, and I do really mean it's, it's the slightest of slights, once you've got through that, the car rewards you with a beautiful communicative helm that has much, much better weighting, transparency and accuracy to it than the regular 458 Italias. It is at that exact moment where the regular car simply fails to step up and shrinks into the darkness that this comes into the light. It's wonderful. And it just so happens that this is quite a timely review. Though in typical JM fashion I have driven the cars all in the wrong order, I have now sampled everything from the F355 Challenge to the 488 Pista. And I suppose you'd also include the F8 Tributo in that as well. Not quite a special, but sort of halfway there. And though I would say if you want the rawest thrills, the biggest smile, the most mechanical buzz around you, the Scuderia is where you're going to find it. This is still a sensational car. And just last night, I had somebody email me saying, James, I'm selling my Scuderia. I fancy a Speciale, but I'm not really sure whether it's the right thing to buy. And never let it be said that I don't do real world consumer advice here on the channel. To that person, I say, yeah, if you want a Speciale, if you've been lusting after it, go for it, get it. It's gonna give you even more speed, even more thrills, and it's not really going to feel like much of a compromise. I'm in sport mode right now, which is how I honestly recommend you start, and I'm not even put it in bumpy road mode, but it takes the road well, 
the gearbox is good, the traction control is excellent. You can feel the rear end moving around a little bit, but it does keep you still going in a straight line. For this generation, Ferrari introduced their side slip control. Well, it effectively lets you drift like a hero without being an actual hero. But because I don't really wish to put my insurance policy to the test, I'm not going to see if it actually works. I'm told that mostly it does, but really, you'd want a track to find out. More importantly though, and perhaps most importantly for me, this car gives me all the tools, all of the knowledge that I require to be able to enjoy it on the road comfortably. I can carry speed, sure, it's very quick. Is it as quick as that 720S? No, it's not. And if you want ultimate speed, go buy that. But I can lose my license in a Scuderia. I can lose my license in a Stradale. Heck, I can lose my license in a 308. I do road reviews of road cars. And this, this is damn, damn good. What I also really quite enjoy is the fact that it isn't just welded to the floor. Once you do really start to get onto it, the car does start to move under you, but in a very friendly way. It just tells you that you're slowly beginning to approach the limit. It just limbers up a little bit and lets you carry on. It's a very, very approachable car, this. Although, I'm still not going to try and find those limits. Because like I said, when you do get to them, sometimes the car will let you go over. In race mode particularly, that rear differential really does let the car wander a little bit. It's not scary, it's not intimidating. <laughs> Just reminds you how much power this thing has. And more real-world consumer advice? This or a 675 LT? Well, for me, that's simple. You want the roof down? Get the McLaren. Roof up? Take the Prancing Pony. Job done. Am I now going to go home and see how much money I could get if I sold the Scud, the F12, and perhaps a kidney? Am I desperate to get one on my driveway? No. I'm still happy with the thrills that the Scuderia gives me. It is a car that is effectively half the price of one of these, and it's definitely not half the car. And in some ways, I find the old school gearbox even more entertaining. Would I also put this at the top of a greatest driver's cars of the last 25 years list? I'm not sure that I would, but has it disappointed? <laughs> not a bit of it. This has met all expectations. And to be honest, when they were so incredibly high, that is a job well done. So then, all I really want to say is a big thank you to John for bringing it out. And as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a car you'd like to see featured on the channel, make sure you email me. My address is in the description of every video. It's talk at jm.com. And I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.